Well, my title from Temple to Village Centre is in fact a modification of the title of a book that was published in 1979 by the very eminent scholar of religion from New Zealand, uh, Harold Turner. Harold published a book he titled From Temple to Meeting House. The slides are organized. There we are. From Temple to Meeting House, the Phenomenology and Theology of Places of Worship. And in that book, Harold argued that Christian church architecture down through the ages has drawn on two basic archetypes, the temple and the meeting house, or we might say also the temple and the synagogue. Harold argues in that book that it's the temple form that has dominated until relatively recent times, or recent 1979 when Harold published the book, in which the meeting house form has become more widespread. Harold's thesis is right, I think, and I'll brief, offer tonight a brief survey of that development. But I also want to suggest that we are seeing now the emergence of a new type, which I've called the village centre. Let's begin with the temple form. Harold outlines several key features of the temple that bridge across religious traditions. Uh, temple form is not peculiar to Christianity, of course. So the first characteristic of the temple form, Harold argues, is that the temple is the center, the center of social life. And often the temple takes centre stage in a geographical sense as well, as in the Parthenon in Athens or the cathedrals of Durham or Milan that are pictured here, St Mark's in Venice, or indeed closer to home, St Paul's Anglican Church here in the Octagon uh, in Dunedin. But even when removed from the centre, geographically speaking, such temple forms remain central to the ritual and religious life of particular communities. The temple is the center around which life revolves and societies are ordered. The second characteristic, Harold argues, is that the temple is often conceived as a microcosm, a representation of the cosmos as a whole. This is evident in quite primitive examples of the temple form that came to be expressed in ever more elaborate detail as the skill of architects and builders developed. Uh, just to give a hint of that for now, we see here a representation of the firmament above in the Archiepiscopal Chapel in Ravenna. Flora and fauna were often used in abundance to depict the cosmos and in the Christian case, the flourishing of creation. Here's an example in the apse mosaic of San Clemente in Rome. So the temple is microcosm as representation of the heavens and the earth is also quite a prominent theme in Jewish scripture. One quote here from Psalm 78, 69, he built his sanctuary like the heavens, like the earth which he has founded forever. The third characteristic, Harold says, is the temple as meeting point. And we mean here not the meeting point for people with one another, but the meeting point between heaven and earth, between the sacred and the profane, between God and the people. And there are a whole range of architectural devices that express uh, the temple as a meeting point. There are gradations of space proceeding from less to more holy, for example. There's the soaring columns and arches and vaults of Gothic architecture depicted here in the Cathedral of Beauvais that reach toward the divine. The symbolism of ascent uh, is also very important in temple architecture. Another architectural device, this again is St. Paul's uh, in the Octagon here in Dunedin. And of course, ascent was, or ascent to the temple, to Jerusalem, was a theme of the Psalms of Ascent that uh, faithful Jews would recite as they went up to Jerusalem. Uh, and the going up, of course, is a kind of symbolic representation of ascending to the presence of God. The elevation of the temple often renders it visible from miles around. Here's Canterbury Cathedral, 
uh, in the UK. And this was important too because temples were often sites of pilgrimage and so for the pilgrims to see the temple appearing in the skyline from many miles away that gave them encouragement as they made that journey towards the sacred space. Soaring pinnacles, columns and towers likewise express the human reach toward the divine and indeed the transcendence of God. They point beyond themselves to the transcendent realm. A fourth characteristic of the temple, Harold argues, is the temple as Domus Dei, or the house of God. Yet a sanctuary of classical Greek and Roman temples often contained a statue of the God to whom the temple was dedicated. Jewish faith was a bit more reticent about the Domus Dei idea. Uh, Solomon, for example, uh, at the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem offers a cautionary word. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. And yet Solomon does go on to pray a little later that God will indeed have his earthly place in this temple. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea, O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer that the servant prays to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you said, my name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer that your servant prays toward this place. Now it's within the inner sanctuary or the holy of holies that the divine presence is thought to dwell. Access to that place is usually restricted to the priests, and in the Jewish case, of course, here at the temple in Jerusalem, it's only the high priest who once a year enters the Holy of Holies in order to make the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. But in the Greek and Roman temple form too, there is a Holy of Holies, an inner sanctuary that the priests would visit. Here's a plan form of the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Now, this is just a very quick sketch of some of the key features of the temple form upon which much church architecture has been based. It's time to consider the influence of that form upon Christian architecture. I've shown some examples already. The medieval and Renaissance cathedrals of Europe all follow this temple form. Let's take St Paul's in London as an example. You'll see very clearly here uh, the echo of the classical Greek and Roman temple architecture, much embellished and developed through the course of the Renaissance and here into 17th century English Baroque. It draws very heavily upon classical style. The uh, Church of St Paul's in London actually follows a basilica style as well. Uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire, when Christianity was spreading rapidly through the empire, churches would often take over existing buildings that had fallen into disuse following the collapse of the Roman Empire. And the Basilica or the Royal Hall was one such form that lent itself easily to the gathering of quite large crowds by this time uh, to worship. The specifically Christian innovation was to add the transits, transits which gave the plan a cruciform Form, obviously uh, representing the cross of Christ. So it's an adaptation of the basilica, but in its detail it still follows the basic temple form. Uh, there's a chancel here, at the, end, at the top end here, where the high altar is, and that's where the priest or would, would uh, conduct the Eucharist, celebrate uh, the Eucharist. Now you notice that actually is a long way away from the nave where the people, the ordinary people would gather uh, and they're separated from the altar not only by this great distance but also by a choir uh, between the people and the Holy of Holies. So there's a very clear gradation of space, a very clear architectural hierarchy uh, that is expressed here. In St Paul's you get a sense of the scale here. Uh, the altar is separated from the people, as I said, by the choir, uh, also by a screen, sorry, um, and that 
separation of the people uh, from the high altar, their exclusion from the Holy of Holies uh, is even more pronounced than many other churches, particularly the Gothic churches of the, the late medieval era. Era. This is Westminster Abbey, and you can see the rude screen there, uh, making the high altar very distant from where the people are. They're not really involved uh, in the action that's going on uh, in the Holy of Holies, except symbolically. Uh, the priest represents them there. So this is classical temple architecture. Let's come back to New Zealand. Uh, the temple form actually has been the dominant form in New Zealand church architecture as well. Here's an example from Dunedin, some of you will be familiar with, uh, Knox Presbyterian Church on George Street, uh, designed by Robert Lawson, who also designed First Church and many other churches around Otago. Uh, Knox was completed in 1876. And beginning from the outside, we may observe, first of all, the soaring spire above the tower and the numerous pinnacles pointing heavenward. This is temple language. The spire, along with the scale of the building in general, gives it a prominence in the landscape, rendering it highly visible for those making pilgrimage to worship. The symbolism, symbolism of ascent is not especially pronounced here at Knox. There are other churches in Dunedin, like St. Joseph's Cathedral, Catholic Cathedral, and St. Paul's in the Octagon, that emphasise the ascent much more dramatically. Note, however, the size of the entrance doors. This is a narrow gate through which you pass into the temple. You don't burst into this place without careful thought uh, and reverence and deliberation. Echo here of the story Jesus tells about passing through uh, the eye of the needle. Uh, you don't come easily uh, into this place. You prepare yourself reverently for entrance. And again, this is much more pronounced in, in the Octagon at St. Paul's. Massive monumental building, but look how small the entrance is. Take care when you enter here. The idea of temple as microcosm is also expressed at Knox, um, particularly in the extensive use of flora in the decoration. Dunedin Nights, I'm not sure how often you've been to Knox and noticed all the decoration, but there's an abundance of, of, of flora in the decoration, both inside and out. You can see the florons here, for instance, in the, in the archivolts, lots of uh, decoration from nature. Uh, in the church. Again, representation of, of the microcosm, creation, is being witnessed to here. Inside the church, we see very clearly a spatial hierarchy, uh, the strong central axis. This temple form of church was often closely associated with pilgrimage, and so the long aisles are representative of the pilgrimage the Christian makes in their journey of faith. I'm always amused when I go into St Paul's Anglican Church uh, in the Octagon, or the Cathedral in the Octagon here in Dunedin. There's a little sign as you enter saying, please sit at the front. But the architecture screams against that uh, because people tend to take up their position here um, without presuming to draw too close to the Holy of Holies. Uh, they keep their distance quite naturally. That's our instinctive thing to do, counting ourselves not quite worthy uh, to, to march straight into the holiest place. So there's that strong hierarchical arrangement of the interior of the church here, characteristic of, of temple form. Central place is given to the communion table, but this is a reformed church. So the lectern where scripture is read, the baptismal font and the pulpit are also prominent, word and sacrament uh, emphasized more or less equally uh, in this place. The distance of, of the holy place or the sanctuary from ordinary worship is often emphasized in temple form by the elevation of the altar. And you can see that here. It gives a prominence to the priest who is celebrating or the minister uh, in Presbyterian language. The hierarchical nature of the architecture is also represented in the prominence given to clergy in this temple form. But of course, the stained glass window behind reminds us that it is Christ who presides over all. 
Neo-Gothic is the most commonly used architectural language for such churches in New Zealand, but we do have some examples as well of classical uh, style. Just a few represented here. This is St Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Simon Street in Auckland on the left. Um, the St. former St Paul's Trinity Pacific in Christchurch, top right, sadly uh, collapsed in the earthquakes. And uh, many of you will be familiar with the Baptist Tabernacle in Auckland, probably the most uh, pure of the classical style churches uh, in New Zealand. It's at the top of Queen Street. <coughs> the church in St Andrews uh, on the left there, there's no precedent for the tower in classical Greek and Roman temple architecture, but the columns rising in the tower successively from the Doric here at the bottom through to the Ionic and upwards to the Corinthian, uh, that's borrowed directly from the classical language of architecture, uh, Greek and Roman temples. I say that form, the temple form, is the most prominent throughout New Zealand. It's represented here too in these very humble two churches, which you'll see up and down the land. They're very humble examples, but they too follow the temple form. This is uh, Pukukau East Presbyterian Church on the left and Dargaville Presbyterian Church on the right. The Campanile, topped with a spire pointing heavenward, is a very modest representation of the towers and the pinnacles of the much more elaborate uh, medieval cathedrals but the same language is being used. So too, the very narrow, constricted entrance, you pass through the narrow gate into this holy place. And inside, I'm sure you can imagine, most of you have been in, in these kinds of churches, you'll see the hierarchical arrangement of space, uh, the long aisle up to uh, a chancel where the communion table or altar uh, will be. It's interesting to ponder the missiology that goes along with this architectural style. The buildings do not express any attempt to open the gates wide to let the people come in. This is architecture of Christendom and there is the natural assumption that the people will come. You need to make no effort, in fact, to go out and reach them. In fact, uh, you make it difficult for them to arrive with the, the bigger sense sometimes uh, and the narrow gate, ensuring that the Christian people out in the community will come reverently to this place. So that is a very brief sketch of the temple style and I'll be happy to talk further about that in our discussion time together. Let's move on to the meeting house. Although the temple is a meeting place, it's not a place to meet one's neighbours. It's a place to meet God. <clears throat> and there's no space for gathering informally, chatting with others or sharing a cup of coffee. It's the meeting place of heaven and earth, of the human with the divine. The meeting house form, on the other hand, places much more emphasis on the gathering of the people and their meeting not only with God, but also with one another. A number of distinguishing features of the meeting house form. To begin with, they're much more open and accessible architecturally. Meeting houses present a more welcoming face to the street and by means of the architecture they encourage people to come in rather than sternly reminding them that this is a sacred space that they shouldn't enter lightly. There's a much less hierarchical interior layout um, that's not to say that there is no hierarchy, there is to some extent, but certain functions are privileged still, uh, notably the preaching of the word in Reformed tradition or uh, the altar for the mass in, in Catholic traditions uh, and Anglican traditions. But typically the communion table or altar is much more accessible. The people gather around it rather than it being in some remote holy of holies. Clergy too are closer to the people, far less removed, both uh, closer both horizontally and vertically. The auxiliary spaces in such churches are much more generous. They allow people to mill around, enter into conversation with one another, share a cup of tea after the service and so on. And I'm sure you'll all be aware the most common addition to an alteration of church buildings 
up and down the land during the latter half of the 20th century involved the provision of much more generous space for welcoming and meeting people. The opening up of churches to the world outside, both spatially and visually. A new missiology was being expressed in which the church realized the need to be much more open, welcoming and accessible to the people who would not routinely make their weekly pilgrimage to meet with God. We see the movement from temple to meeting house quite explicitly articulated in Catholic churches after the Second Vatican, Vatican Council during the 1960s. Um, we can see many examples in New, New Zealand Catholic churches of that transition from temple to meeting house being expressed uh, often through the adaptation of old temple form, form buildings, but also in the new Catholic architecture that's been built uh, since Vatican II. Uh, St Joseph's Cathedral is, provides us just a hint of that transition. Classic temple style, as you see here, uh, the soaring towers, the visibility from, from far, far and wide, the great monolithic structure, the ascent to the narrow gate and so on, all these classical uh, temple forms. But when we go inside, uh, we see that expressed as well. And note the altar on the back wall, the priest would have celebrated the mass with his back to the people. All right, so it's not a gathering around a table, it's the priest celebrating on behalf of the people, as in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement in the temple uh, in Jerusalem. But the interesting thing to note here is there now is a new altar, a much more modest one that has been brought closer to the people. So the priest now stands facing the people. They are drawn into the, the altar much more intimately than they were uh, previously. Now that's a very modest adaptation to try and give expression to this fact that we're moving not only from a hierarchical, uh, not from a, we're moving from a hierarchical temple structure to a more gathering of the people uh, around the table. Here's another example of Dunedin of a Catholic church. This is St Patrick's Basilica in Dunedin and you see they've made much more dramatic alterations. Uh, you can see the elongated classical temple form here uh, and the altar still uh, in the chancel here um, with its uh, fixed to the back wall so the priest would celebrate with his back to the people but they've rearranged it recently in a renovation about three years ago so that the people are now gathered around the table which has been brought out um, and is now much more accessible to the people. Visually that's a little jarring to see this arrangement in, in, in this classic temple form, but I think in a service during the Mass itself that actually works uh, quite well. So these are churches in transition from temple to meeting house style, attempting to adapt the, art, uh, the architecture to this new understanding of what the Ecclesia is about. Uh, notice too the other feature of the renovation of St Patrick's a few years ago was the provision, well, the ditching of the narrow gate and the provision of a much more open welcoming entrance. This is easy access church now, let's try to say, uh, inviting the people to come in. And once you get in, uh, a generous space for, for gathering, for pausing, for talking with others, uh, rather than going into the Holy of Holies uh, and then escaping home afterwards. But there are many examples of Catholic churches up and down the land that have been built, built according to the new meeting house form rather than uh, attempting to adapt the old temple form. Here I think is the, the masterpiece of, of New Zealand architecture, uh, John Scott's Futuna Chapel uh, in Korori. Some of you may have visited that and if you haven't I encourage you to do so. Unfortunately it's open just one Sunday a month but it's well worth uh, a visit. This was actually slightly before Vatican II. It was built in 1961 by and for the Brothers of the Society of Mary. It was not built as a parish church, uh, built for a relatively small community. And John Scott, the Māori architect, understood very well the needs of a small community meeting for worship as a frequent part of their daily rhythms. Uh, the meeting house rather than the temple was the appropriate form for them. Uh, we can see here that the pews surround two sides of the altar. Uh, 
another characteristic of the meeting house form is you, you can see other worshippers in the face rather than just looking at the back of their heads as in uh, the temple form. Here's another more recent example, another Catholic church, St. Joseph's in Wellington. You'll see this on the right just as you come out of the Victoria Tunnel uh, heading into town. And again, much more accessible entrance. You don't have to go to any great, uh, or exert any great energy to enter here. Uh, it's an easy access church. And it's an entrance uh, form that invites people in. Inside St. Joseph's, we enter first into a very generous foyer space, encourages you to mill around, to enter into fellowship with others, to enjoy a coffee after the service and so on. Uh, it's a little bare looking here. These photos were taken quite soon after it was completed. Uh, I hope by now it perhaps uh, has a little more life in terms of the decoration and other paraphernalia that indicate a living uh, community. The baptismal font, not pictured here, is actually in this foyer. So that's a sign of entrance into this living community of faith. The theme of fellowship and gathering is also evident in the interior of the worship space. Most striking here, of course, is again the people gathering around uh, the Lord's table rather than it being remote from them. The family of God gathers in fellowship at the table. And again, this provides the opportunity to see other worshippers face to face. Uh, we meet each other in worship, uh, not just God. We meet God, of course, but also we meet each other uh, in worship. In plan view, the gathering embrace of the chairs, the pews, is, is very evident. Uh, here, as you can see, they're gathering around the central also, which protrudes out into the midst of the people, rather than being uh, remote from them. Uh, another aspect of the building that is very welcoming and attempts to set people at ease is that the foyer is not coercive. Uh, you're not forced straight into the worship space, as you were with those little wooden churches in Dargaville uh, and other places in New Zealand. The foyer actually feeds into four distinct areas. There's a little chapel here, there's the main worship space here. So you come in off the street uh, this way. Um, you can come into a meeting room or you can go out into a little courtyard garden. So there's four options for people who come here. It, it, it's, a, it's a place to come, linger, enjoy different features of what the space might have to offer. It's not simply in and out for the worship of the temple. You're encouraged uh, to engage in many more activities uh, in this space. There's also a hint of the cruciform plan here, you can see, um, which echoes the Basilica cruciform plans of earlier Catholic architecture. But I'm told that this uh, four-directional feature of the plan is also an attempt to pick up the familiar Māori motif and which visitors are welcome from the directions of the four winds, the Ho Afar. So they come from east and west, north and south and so on. Let me take you now to a Presbyterian church in Auckland. This is Somerville Presbyterian Church in Remuera. Here we have uh, the street view, obviously, uh, but we then find an entrance, which is again broad uh, and welcoming, a big um, canopy stretches out to give you shelter as you come into this church and as you can imagine on a Sunday morning or when any other events are happening these doors are opened wide it's not the narrow gate any longer uh, we want people to come in this church uh, is saying the sanctuary inside again is a gathering around the table uh, slightly less pronounced but again opportunity to see other worshippers uh, face to face. A little bit of an echo of the temple form in the central aisle uh, leading up to the altar. Uh, a little too much elevation of the communion table and the, the minister perhaps for genuine meeting house style, but nevertheless uh, other elements express the meeting house form quite strongly here. The reason I've chosen this church, however, is that it moves us into what I think is an emerging style, which I've called the village centre. Uh, 
The first expressions of this form of church architecture were typically called community centres. But I think there are now some interesting developments beyond the typical form of the community centre. The community centre tended to involve the building of a multi-purpose space, so that a space used for worship on Sundays could be turned into a badminton court on Monday, an indoor bowls club on Tuesday, an after school club on Wednesday, <coughs> largely by rearranging the furniture. The idea was that people from the community would come and use the space in the hope that some of them might start coming to church on Sundays. The result, however, was often, architecturally speaking, very bland. I suggest it involved also a loss of theological nerve. Now, I'm sticking my neck out here. Uh, the way we make ourselves relevant to the community is to provide a basketball court. That, for me, is a loss of theological nerve. Valuable though basketball courts might be. So the greatest casualty in architectural terms, again, was most often the space left over for worship. The blandness of the multi-purpose spaces tended to destroy any sense of sacredness, of sanctuary, or of reverence for the divine. You felt like you were worshipping in a basketball court, and that's uh, not especially conducive to a sense of reverence for the sacred, uh, for the divine. But some of all advances beyond that idea of a community centre with a multi-purpose complex that offers a whole variety of spaces that are suitable for different activities. There is a dedicated worship space, as we see here, but that's complemented by a range of other spaces where other functions and events can take place. Entry into the building opens up a range of options, as did St. Joseph's Catholic Church. And there are, in fact, multiple entrance points to the building. So there is at Somerville a worship centre, there's a kindergarten and a space for a playgroup, two distinct spaces, in fact. Uh, there's an opportunity shop, uh, a hall for, oh, there's the opportunity shop, a hall for functions of various kinds, indoor bowls, etc. There's office space, there's small meeting rooms, there's kitchen and catering facilities, there's places simply to sit and chat. So it's not one size space fits all. It provides a whole variety of spaces and a whole range of activities can be going on uh, at the same time. So there's the opportunity here for various groups to be using uh, the buildings at the same time and to cross paths with one another uh, to interact. But the sacred worship space is ever present. It's not dismantled during the week. It's there as a central feature of this building as people gather for other purposes uh, during the course of the week. Now the architecture of Somerville isn't entirely successful in my view. It's a little caught between different forms and a little unsure perhaps of exactly what it wants to be, but it does take some very interesting steps toward a new conception of the function and purpose of the church building, steps towards the village centre idea of church architecture. And again, we're seeing an evolution of missiology, I think. A missiology is emerging now, which involves a recovery or a reinvention of the neighbourhood. The modern city and much about contemporary culture has undermined the neighbourhood. Communities have become much less cohesive, more fragmented. And with it has come an erosion of the neighbourhood as people get into their cars to disappear off to other parts of the city to engage in their very various activities. And we might well live next door to people with a wall dividing us uh, with no possibility of chatting to the neighbours over the fence. Christianly speaking, there's a slow erosion of opportunity to love one's neighbours right next door. So the church has a role to play, I think, in re-establishing the neighbourhood and of taking up afresh the command to love our neighbour as ourselves. The village centre is an attempt 
to gather the neighbourhood together uh, and provide opportunity for a whole range of activities, but also provide opportunity for interaction between people. I want to show you two further examples briefly just to, to wrap things up here. Um, these two examples come from Christchurch, which, as we all know, sadly had opportunity to rebuild many church buildings following uh, the earthquakes. This is a new Presbyterian church in Brindua, uh, which actually calls itself the village. There are some particularly noteworthy features of the building, not especially beautiful in my view, uh, but has all kinds of other attractive features, which I'll go through uh, just briefly. One of these is to notice that the building is see-through, transparent. There's no attempt to disguise what might go on within this building. Uh, it's very open and light and see-through. People can walk past on the street and see that there's something going on here. Uh, perhaps they might be attracted to uh, what is going on. To the left is the minister's study. Uh, so the team of three ministers, as it happens, in this church uh, sit here, work together, and again are visible from the community. So people walking past on the street during the week can see that this is an occupied building. There are people there. They might be tempted to knock on the door, to go in, to inquire what's going on, or indeed uh, to seek assistance of various kinds. Visibility and openness, transparency, uh, is the key here. Inside, as we also saw at Somerville, there are options for a whole range of activities to be going on simultaneously in different parts of the building. A table for communion of various kinds, either the formal celebration of the Lord's Supper or simply sitting around with a cup of coffee with someone during the week. Uh, is a central feature of the building that remains in place uh, most of the time. It also reminds us that communion lies at the heart of the church's life. This is not put away on days during the week. It remains there as a permanent representation of what this community village centre uh, it centres around. Around the main space all kinds of things might happen multiple spaces in the building for the fostering of friendship and fellowship, communion. Uh, there's a coffee maker nearby and people can grab a coffee and sit down and chat uh, with one another. Again, there's an opportunity shop, a Saturday market, a children's play space, a foot clinic that operates once a month for elderly people in the neighbourhood, and a chapel. Again, that is set up permanently in this form. So anyone can come in at any time and enjoy some quiet, some sanctuary in this space. And outside too, there's provision for further activity, a community barbecue, space for youth and children's activity, and so on. So I think one of the key features of the village centre model, in contrast with some expressions of the multi-purpose community centre model, is that it is genuinely, explicitly Christ-centred not just on Sundays, but throughout the week. I think the model of providing a basketball court for, because that's what the kids want and hoping there might be some connection with the church without making that very explicit in the building hasn't worked very well and is questionable, I think, from a missiological point of view. So I think we need to consider afresh in our church architecture how all the activities undertaken by churches today might be explicitly Christian in character and in intent. At Brindwa, the Christ-centeredness is expressed in the communion table, as I've already mentioned, but also in the form of a cross that is the predominant structural element in the building and the major source of light. So beams of light come through this cruciform shape that spans the whole length of the building, a constant reminder of what this community is about. One last example, this is Oxford Terrace Baptist Church. Interestingly here for my theme, uh, there's the old columns salvaged from the collapsed building uh, in the earthquake, the, the temple form that stands at the front now of this building that is now formed as a village centre. 
we come in these doors and straight away we find ourselves with a signpost, confronted by a signpost, that gives directions to all kinds of different activities and spaces uh, available in the, build, in the building. It's a whole range of spaces available um, and uh, various community groups and NGOs have their offices here. World Visions base in Christchurch, for example, uh, is in this building. There's a cafe. Um, there's an offices, offices for workplace support. There's meeting rooms of various kinds, uh, places to sit and have your coffee that you might have grabbed uh, with somebody. Spaces uh, for children, places to sit and chat. Um, these can be used on Sunday, of course, but also the place is open throughout the week and people are encouraged to come in and be part of this village centre. So the church is engaged here in a reinvigoration of the neighbourhood, providing places of meeting, not just on Sunday, but throughout the week in response to the needs of the community. Here is the worship space. And again, it's set aside as a sanctuary. It's not converted into a badminton court on Mondays or whatever. So it's constantly there, uh, indicating that worship is the centre of this uh, village facility space for the children in the worship space, welcoming, open, accessible, very little hierarchy here, not totally absent, uh, but the people gather around in fellowship with one another. So 50 years ago, Harold Turner identified two prominent forms of church architecture, the temple and the meeting house. But since then, I've suggested there, is involved, uh, there has evolved two new forms, the community centre, which has been multi-purpose but single space, that can be adapted to various purposes. And now much more recently, the village centre with multiple spaces dedicated to particular purposes and centred around the space for worship. Again, there's a missiology accompanying this new form, I think, which holds more promise in my view than the community centre with its rather one dimensional space. I've called this form the village centre and the missiology involves, as I've suggested, the reinvention or perhaps the reinvigoration of the neighbourhood. The form is explicitly Christ-centred and it gives expression once more to Christ's command to love God and to love your neighbour as yourself. So, here we are. I'd be glad now to enter into conversation with you about observations you might uh, have 